study we're going to be looking at is titled, quote, Scalp Microbiome and Sebum Composition in Japanese Male Individuals with and Without Androgenetic Alopecia, unquote, by Suzuki et al., published to Microorganisms, a journal, in 2021. Now, the findings from this study revealed that individuals with androgenetic alopecia had higher levels of triglycerides and palmitic acid in their sebum compared to those without androgenetic alopecia. Palmitic acid, a common saturated fatty acid, is of particular interest due to its implications in the skin's lipid barrier and microbial environment. The study showed an increased abundance of the lipophilic fungus Malesthesia restricta on the scalp of androgenetic alopecia patients. This fungus, Malesthesia restricta, is known to consume sebum, specifically consuming the palmitic acid, which could influence the health of the scalp and potentially exacerbate androgenetic alopecia. Furthermore, the bacterial composition of the scalp also show differences between groups with an increased abundance of Cudi bacterium and a decreased abundance of Corini bacterium. Now, both of these bacterium are gram-positive bacteria, and they are very commonly found on the skin. But the Cudi bacterium is more commonly found in the sebaceous glands itself, while the Corini bacterium is typically distributed everywhere. And I just realized... Cootie bacterium? Like, oh, you have cooties? Do you guys remember that growing up where somebody would say so-and-so has cooties or whatever? <laughs> I don't know. I just thought that would be interesting to add. So, you know, getting back to the video. But it might be the case that as the cootie bacterium increases because of this specific impact that, you know, whatever androgenetic alopecia is doing, and we know what it's doing. It's DHT that's causing these sebaceous glands to kind of act weird, right? As the levels of palmitic acid and other triglycerides go, go up, it's going to create a condition where the bacterium that are in the sebaceous glands will fester and eat up, you know, those nutrients first before it can ever reach any other part of the skin. So the bacterium that tends to be outside of the sebaceous glands, they're not getting any sort of that sebum themselves, so they begin to dwindle in numbers. And this could be bad because some of these bacterium have very essential roles. They actually do good things for your skin. So for instance, if we look at the paper just briefly, right? Briefly look at the paper titled, quote, The Skin Microbiota, Balancing Risk and Reward, unquote, by Loris Flowers and Elizabeth A. Grice. We can get an understanding that the corny bacterium species can inhibit other bacteriums that tend to cause skin diseases, essentially by producing free fatty acids that disrupt those pathogens' growth. So the corny bacterium species tends to have this sort of competitive interaction with other harmful bacteriums. So if you're having a decline, as we see in this particular paper, it tends to be that men with androgenetic alopecia have this sort of decline of the cornium bact of the corny bacterium, sorry, then you know, you're, they're going to be placed at a higher risk of having these sort of skin pathologies, right? And they can have acne, they can have seborrheic dermatitis, and you can have seborrheic dermatitis on your face and your scalp, by the way. They're going to be at a higher risk for those kinds of things. And that's all because of there being an alteration to the lipid content of the sebum. And that alteration tends to favor bacteriums in certain areas of the skin, and it harms others in other areas of the skin, which very much so destabilizes people. And I know there are many people in my audience that talk about how, you know, they had issues with acne, they had folliculitis in, this, in their scalp, and then they also had androgenetic alopecia. You know, those are all correlated to some sense, right? So we have to figure out what's going on here. And I think the mediating factor between all of this would be the, you know, the lipid content, what your lipids are becoming due to the influence of various factors, whether it's DHT and also, you know, to an extent, diet. But still, I want to, you know, look at the graphs of this study now, right? If you look at the men with androgenetic alopecia, yeah, they had a higher abundance of QT bacteria, but also the Staphylococcus bacteria as well. And we already know this leads to staph infections of many kind, like folliculitis, abscesses and, you know, and boils, you know, cellulitis, all, you know, these are common things. And I just want you guys to, again, think what the issue here is. It's lipids. Lipids are causing this sort of change. Let's keep looking at the graph, right? You also have the higher, you know, 
presence of specific fungi, the Malesthesia restricta. You know, you get seborrheic dermatitis from that particular species, right? Not, you know, just that subspecies, but overall that species itself. But ideally, there's a balance between all of these things. You kind of want them to have some sort of weird competition between each other, where you don't want to completely favor one completely over the other, because that can also tip it towards pathology. But we can clearly see from this graph that, you know, and the graphs from this study, that certain things are just in higher prevalence with men that have androgenetic alopecia, and that will lead them to have a certain kind of predisposition towards skin conditions. Now, before we move on to the next study, I just want to look at this heat map from this Japanese sebum androgenetic alopecia study, right? Because I think this will be a good way to kind of see actually what's going on, right? To see which lipids are more prevalent overall. So we're just going to run down the whole list itself. So the heat map displays the correlation between various skin lipids in the presence of different microbial genera or I guess species or whatever, in two groups, right? So you have those with androgenetic alopecia and those without androgenetic alopecia. Those are the two groups we're focusing on. And each row here represents a different microbial genus, such as the cornibacterium, staphylococcus, and malesthesia, among others. Each column here represents a type of skin lipid, including free fatty acids, triglycerides, squalene, and cholesterol esters. So the colors in the heat map range from blue to red, and blue indicates a negative correlation between the lipids and the presence of the specific microbial category or, or life, right? So meaning lower levels of the lipid are associated with a higher presence of the genus. That would indicate, again, a negative correlation. The red color to us indicates a positive correlation where the higher levels of the lipid are associated with a higher presence of that particular species of microbial life or genus. So the intensity of the color, again, keep this in mind, would represent the strength of the correlation with the darker shades indicating a stronger correlation and obviously the lighter shades being the opposite, a weaker correlation. So just a quick observation in this heat map on the screen, you can see that the lipids of concern, particularly in relation to androgenetic alopecia, include triglycerides, squalene, and cholesterol esters, which show a notable presence and correlation with specific microbial life. So hopefully you can see what we've been talking about just by looking at this heat map. And just for the hell of it, so we can, you know, understand what's going on, let's just focus on the QD bacterium, right, between the AGA group and the non-AGA group, right? If we look at the category concerning free fatty acids, what do we notice? In both the AGA group and the non-AGA group, that cell, right, is dark blue. So what does that indicate for us? It shows us that regardless whether you have androgenetic alopecia or you don't have androgenetic alopecia, QD bacterium is associated with the reduced levels of free fatty acids in the scalp or, you know, scalp skin or whatever, right? However, when we look at the triglycerides in relation to QD bacterium between the AGA group and the non-AGA group, we notice something, right? There is a light red color for triglycerides in the non-AGA group in respects to QD bacterium. In the AGA group, we have a darker red color for triglycerides, suggesting a stronger association with higher levels of triglycerides. So this implies that in the AGA or the androgenetic alopecia group, that's what AGA means, by the way, androgenetic alopecia people, patients, whatever you want to call these, us, because if you're watching this video, you probably have androgenetic alopecia yourself, we tend to produce more triglycerides in our sebum. And those triglycerides feed the QT bacterium, right? It, the same thing happens in people that have, you know, non-androgenetic alopecia, people who don't have AGA, right? That same thing can happen in them. If you were to, you know, give them a diet that increases their triglyceride output in their sebum, it could be the case that they would end up with having more QT bacterium. Maybe they're, it won't be as much as us, right? You know, comparatively speaking, because they have a whole host of, you know, different bacterium that's also being fed 
other sort of lipids as well that can probably outcompete the cutie bacterium proliferation. But it just goes to show us that high triglyceride levels influence more cutie bacterium, which cutie bacterium tends to be associated with more issues, right? So hopefully that made sense and you guys can see how intricate and important sebum is in androgenetic alopecia. 